It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second night of the sixth annual Penn World Voices of International Literature. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And now it's my great pleasure to turn over the program to Robert Silvers, editor of the New York Review of Books. Thank you. Well, I, I uh, want to welcome you all. The, it is a truly uh, international festival and a truly international evening. Uh, thanks to Larry Seams and uh, Carol Llewellyn of Penn. Thanks also to the Frit Oid Freedom of Expression Foundation in Oslo, um, <clears throat> which is a very generous uh, organization and which wants precisely to put on discussions like this. Then there's the Royal Norwegian um, Consulate General and its ambassador, uh, Cecil Bria. He's supporting the evening. And then a final sponsor is us, the New York Review. We've published many articles on this question of climate change. Among our principal writers on the question uh, are two of our speakers this evening, Jim Hansen and Bill McKibben. Now, they'll be joined tonight by five other very distinguished speakers. They'll speak in alphabetical order, and then they'll have an opportunity to discuss them among themselves, and then we'll have some questions from the audience. I should say and repeat that our topic tonight is not whether uh, there are problems with climate change. We proceed on the premise that there are very serious developments with respect to global warming, and one our major question is just how they're affecting the world and what can be done about them. Lord Stern, an author of a report on climate to the British government, observed that, and this is something he's writing for the New York Review, acting as if the scientific ed evidence were wrong would lead us to concentrations of carbon carrying immense risks if the evidence were right. Our first speaker is appropriately uh, Justin Garda. He's one of our Norwegian guests. He's the author of one of the most widely read books in recent history, the novel Sophie's World. It's been bought by over 30 million people. It's about the encounter of a teenage girl with central issues of natural philosophy. It followed from this success that uh, Justine Garter and his wife set up the Sophie Prize. It's an international prize of $100,000. It's awarded to a person, organization, uh, that's been pioneering not only in um, calling attention to dangers, but who points the way toward practical alternative uh, measures. So we're lucky that our next speaker is Jim Hansen, who, as it happens, actually won the Sophie Prize this year. And since, uh, <laughs> now, since 1981, Jim has been the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. It analyzes global climate in order to predict atmospheric changes. He's widely known as a scientist who, in his testimony uh, before Congress in uh, 1988, brought global warming to wide public attention. He has since been a major voice in project, projecting its consequences and proposing solutions. On some occasions, I'm glad to say, in the New York Review, and recently in his book, Storms of My Grandchildren, just published last year. Now, with Frederick Hoag, we return to Norway. He's been co-founder and leader of the Bologna Foundation, an Oslo-based environmental NGO that he co-founded co in 1986. He once said, and I quote him, we're a nice little selfish country of petrolholics. And that gives us an extreme obligation to use some of that welfare to develop some of the technologies we need. And he's done so particularly through programs co collaborating with heavy industry, such as Anglo Dutch Shell. He wants to find solutions to lower carbon emissions by capturing and storing them. He helped 
Saab to launch a bioethanol car in Norway last year. From Norway, we go to Dem Denmark and to Bjorn Lomborg, the very well-known Danish teacher, professor, writer, now director of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. He became famous for his book, The Skeptical Environmentalist, which raised questions about the effectiveness of much current political approach to global warming. If we look at some of his more recent statements, we see on the one hand that he warns us against asking, quote, leaders to consign their people to poverty for the sake of climate, while on the other, he calls for, quote, actually doing something to solve the problem by committing serious amounts of money to green energy research and development. We can, I suspect, a somewhat different point of view from our next speaker, Bill McKibben, long-standing uh, uh, writer on these subjects. His book, The End of Nature, published in 1989, is widely considered to be the first book urgently warning about climate change, the first book written for a general audience. He's the founder of 350.org, the international campaign to stop the acceleration of climate change by reducing atmospheric carbons below 350 parts per million. He's written much about alternative energy, about spoilation of the planet, about the risks associated with genetic engineering. His most recent book, spelled E-A-A-R-T-H, Making a Life on a Tough New Planet, just been published. Then we turn to Andrew Rivkin. He's written on the environment for the New York Times since 1995. All of us um, have come to rely on his reports. Most recently in his Dot Earth blog, which according to the Times, wants to um, examine efforts to balance human affairs with the planet's limits. In, 19, in uh, 2008, he became the first science reporter to win the John Chancellor Award from Columbia University. Now, that's a prize given to a journalist who may not be widely known, but who is highly respected within the profession for the caliber of his or her work. And finally, and appropriately, we end with Cynthia Rosenzweig. She's a distinguished colleague of Jim Hansen's. She's not only a public commentator on the environment, but an accomplished scientific investigator into its meaning and behavior. She's a senior research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute, where she heads the Climate Impact Group. She's a professor of environmental science at Barnard College. She's a senior research scientist at Columbia Earth Institute Center for Climate Systems Research. And she also served as the chief research scientist and co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. And now, our first speaker, Justine Gordon. Thank you. An important basis of all ethics has been the golden rule or the principle of reciprocity. You shall do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the golden rule can no longer just have a horizontal dimension. In other words, a we and the others. We must realize that the principle of reciprocity also has a vertical dimension. You shall do to the next generation what you wished the previous generation had done to you. It's as simple as that. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. This must obviously include your neighbor generation. It has to include absolutely everyone who will live on the earth after us. The human family doesn't inhabit earth simultaneously. People have lived here before us. Some are living now and some will live after us. But those who come after us are also our fellow human beings. 
The code is that simple. We have no right to hand over a planet Earth that is less worth than the planet we ourselves have had the good fortune to live on. Fewer fish in the sea, less drinking water, less food, less rainforest, less coral reefs, fewer species of plants and animals, less beauty, less breathtaking, less splendor and joy. The greatest triumph of philosophy to date may be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights were not given us by the powers above, nor were they pulled out of thin air. They mark the end of a thousand year long process of maturation, human maturation. 10 years into the 21st century, the question may be posed, how long can we speak of our rights without at the same time focusing on our responsibilities? Perhaps we need a new universal declaration. The time is ripe for a universal declaration of human obligations. We now seem to be standing right on the threshold of dramatic consequences of human-induced climate change, while Opinion polls at the same time suggest that the inhabitants of the world are really not particularly concerned. Yet, the denial of all reports of human-induced climate change must be reckoned among the world's greatest conspiracy theories. The fact is that human activity alters the surroundings and vital necessities on our planet to such an extent that we are now beginning to refer to the period in which we are living as a completely new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. In plants and animals, in the sea and in oil, coal and gas, Enormous quantities of carbon are just itching to become oxidized and slip out into the atmosphere. The atmosphere on dead planets like Venus and Mars consists mainly of carbon dioxide, and this would have been the situation here too if living nature and Earth processes had not kept the carbon in check. However, from the mid-18th century, the reserves of fossil fuel have tempted us like Aladdin's genie in the lamp. Release me from the lamp, the carbon has whispered, and we have allowed ourselves to be tempted. Now we are trying to force the genie back into the lamp. If all the oil coal and gas still to be found on this planet is extracted and released into the atmosphere, our civilization will quite simply not survive. Nevertheless, many people consider it their crystal clear right to extract and burn all the oil and all the coal on their own national territory. Why should it not just as well be the crystal clear right of rainforest nations to do what they want with their rainforests? At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there were 275 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Today, the figure has risen to 387 and is just continuing to increase with destructive climate change as an indisputable consequence. Sooner or later, we must try to return to a pre-industrial level. Now, Dr. James Hansen has pointed out that at least initially, we must get down to at any rate a maximum of 350 ppm to feel reasonably certain of avoiding the really major disasters for the planet and for our civilization. The trend, though, is going the other way. If we are to succeed in saving our food supply and the biological diversity of this planet, there will need to be a Copernican revolution in our way of thinking. Living as though everything centers around our time is just as naive as it was to believe that all celestial bodies orbit our planet. Our time, however, has no more central importance than all the epochs that will come after us. For us, 
Our own time is naturally of the very greatest importance, but we cannot live as though our time is the most important for those who come after us too. Both between individuals and in relations between nations, we have succeeded in getting out of a state of nature. However, we are still in a state of raw lawlessness when it comes to the relationship between the generations. Perhaps the geocentric cosmology was naive, but is it less naive to live as though we had several planets to harvest from instead of the one we have to share? Maybe the only living creature in the entire universe, uh, maybe, maybe the only living creatures in the entire universe who has a man may be, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, closing now. Man may be the only living creature in the entire universe who has a universal consciousness. I mean a sense of this entire huge and enigmatic universe we are all a part of. So conserving the living environment on this planet isn't just a global responsibility. It is a cosmic responsibility. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I'm um, glad that I was able to land at LaGuardia uh, in, 10 minutes, in order to get here 10 minutes before we started. And I'm told I should um, talk about what we can do to um, stabilize climate. And I'm allowed five to seven minutes to do that. <laughs> um, and, and, by, and by the way, I'm especially glad that I was able to get here because uh, my wife, Anique, just told me that our daughter-in-law has gone into labor. And so <laughs> we will soon have, <laughs> we will soon have our fourth grandchild. Now, what is clear from the geophysics, from the constraints about what we must do, because we know how much carbon there is in the remaining oil in the ground, approximately, how much there is in gas, how much there is in coal, and how much there is in unconventional fossil fuels like tar sands and tar shale. And what is clear is that, as the previous speaker said, we cannot burn all of those fossil fuels. We're going to burn much of the remaining oil and gas just because of the infrastructure that's set up. But we are going to have to phase out the coal emissions over the next few decades. And we are going to have to avoid the use of most of the unconventional fossil fuels. And thirdly, we should not be going to the ends of the earth to extract the last drop of oil and gas to the deepest ocean, to Antarctica, to the Arctic, because the technologies can eventually get quite a lot out one way or another. And we just can't do that and keep the, um, the carbon dioxide amount in the atmosphere within a level that will avoid disastrous effects. Um, it, if we do burn all the f fossil fuels, it guarantees that we will pass tipping points. The most imminent one is probably the, um, the most imminent major one is probably disintegration of the ice sheets. In just the last six to eight years, the rate at which ice is being lost, net loss from Greenland has increased from 150 to 250 cubic kilometers per year. And from Antarctica, it's doubled from 75 to 150 cubic kilometers per year. If it doubles a few more times, then you know we're 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 in deep trouble because that at that level, the uh, cooling of the high latitude oceans by the ice being dumped into the ocean will will cause the the temperature of the North Atlantic and the southern ocean around Antarctica to actually decrease at the same time that the tropical ocean temperatures are continuing to increase. And this increased temperature gradient 
will drive uh, stronger cyclonic uh, frontal storms, which already in, on occasions can develop near hurricane strength. But if we, if we go down that route, we will have hurricane strength uh, winds at mid-latitudes uh, mid with a rising sea level. And that means that, we, that the kind of disaster that we had at New Orleans will be occurring at cities like New York and London and Tokyo and the economic and social chaos that would be associated with that would, would make it very difficult to do anything about um, minimizing the climate impacts. So, uh, and that's, those kind of storms are the ones that I talk about in my book in the chapter called Storms of My Grandchildren. And uh, the, furthermore, if we burn all of the fossil fuels and extract the unconventional fossil fuels, which you might think is crazy, but in fact we just signed an agreement with Canada to make a pipeline for bring tar sands oil to the United States. Uh, that, that means we would almost assuredly cause the methane hydrates on the continental shelf to begin to melt and put the methane into the atmosphere. The, the last time, that, when that has happened before, it's caused by itself. The methane has caused a global warming of six to nine degrees Celsius. So it's likely that we would, that we would uh, send the planet beyond the runaway greenhouse effect and uh, eventually, it would take time. You have, have to first melt all the ice, but uh, we would uh, exterminate all life on the planet. And that's in the chapter in the year 2525 in my book. But now, what can, so let me get to the point. What can we do? Um, as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, we are going to continue to use them. You can try to cap them someplace, but then the, the, the use just occurs someplace else. Even a successful cap that causes some reduction in the use just reduces the demand for the fuel. It gets cheaper and somebody else, someplace else, will burn it. Uh, what we have to do is put a, a um, rising price on carbon emissions. That means a flat fee or tax across the board of oil, gas, and coal at the source, at the mine or wellhead or port of entry. And all of that money has got to be returned to the public. You can't let Congress give it away to um, clean for uh, projects like clean coal. Uh, you can't let them give it away to their favorite lobbyist. It's the money has got to go to the public so that they have the money to, to make the changes that are needed to move to a, a carbon-free um, uh, future. And um, the idea, the only way we could, this has to be global. And basically that means China and the United States have got to agree that there has to be a rising price on carbon. And uh, because China and India, in no way will they accept a cap on their economy. Uh, and why should they? Their emissions are a factor of 10 less than ours on a per capita basis. They're not going to cap their economy. They said that flat out and they will not. There's no chance that they will do that. But why would they accept a fee on carbon? Because they realize that they, China is doing everything right. They ha, are investing enormously in nuclear power, solar power, wind power, clean energies, because their air and water is so dirty. They must, they want to move to clean energy future, and they know where it's headed. And in order to let those clean energies compete against the fossil fuels, you have to put a fee on the fossil fuels to make them pay for the damage that they do to human health, the environment, and future generations. So that's, uh, uh, so that's basically what has to be done. That's what we can do, and we have to insist that Congress do a simple, honest thing, not the hocus pocus that's in these bills in Congress now. It's got to be a simple, honest price on carbon with the money given to the public 
as a green check every month or perhaps some combination of reduced payroll taxes. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me here. When I woke up this morning, I got a weather report. I'm living in Norway, close to the Arctic. Uh, I started Bologna Foundation back in 86, and the weather report today was that the temperature increase in average in the Arctic since 89 was more than 35 uh, Fahrenheit, or more than 2.1 uh, degrees Celsius the last 20 years. That's really, really scary. And during our trips in the Arctic, we see the changes in the ecological system and in the nature. As an environmental activist, we have to be clear and loud, but there is a big difference from when we started Bologna and we break into factories and digged up dangerous waste and so on, it was easy to point at the problem. Today, we have to point at the solutions. In Bologna, we think that the change of regulatory framework, economic framework, legal framework for the business is crucial to achieve. And we need to support the development of technologies, but not only with research, but with large-scale deployment. And we have no time to lose. The Stone Age didn't end because the lack of stones, and the Oil Age is not going to end because it's a lack of oil. That's why we need brave politicians that go ahead and dare to do the changes. But as we have learned in Bologna Foundation, it's crucial to also work together with the industry. They are the reason to the problem, but they are also definitely a part of the solution. As an environmental activist that has been arrested more than once, quite many times, in environmental actions, it seems maybe quite crazy to work together with the industry, but I think it's necessary. I say this because there is not one single solution to global warming and climate change. We need several. Most of all, I think that we need to understand that the technologies that is needed here is already available. I agree very much with Mr. Hansen on a carbon tax, but I think we also need to put other regulations in order. One of the things I've been working with for a long time, in fact, since I found a secret document in a Norwegian oil company called Statoil that said that carbon capture and storage is an option we, make, we must make use of if the greenhouse effect is real. Um, Bologna Foundation has been working with this option for a long time. And the reason is that when we look at today's need, with two-thirds of the global population that has a legitimate need for more energy, that we have uh, to cut the CO2 emissions in the rich countries with more than 80% and in the developing countries with more than 50% the next year. We need a lot of fresh water, we need a lot of energy, and it's complicated because the energy input to produce all the silicium for the solar wafers, all the aluminium for the frames, or all the steel for the offshore windmills, or whatsoever, we need to do transitions. And carbon capture uh, and storage is one of those options. And three, four years ago, among others, the, the science from Mr. James Hansen is in, inspired me, and I asked, what if that man is right? What could we do then? And that's why we're working so heavily now in Bologna Foundation to create carbon negative value chains. We need to focus on how to grow biomass in another way, and we cannot do that only with fresh water. We need to make use of seawater to produce the future biomass. We need to look at co-firing with biomass and coal with carbon capture and storage because 
that's a way that we cannot exclude because we are very, very late in combating global warming. When we look at what kind of weapons we have, we need to have in our mind that it's needed with a broad set of weapons in this fight. And I think that through projects as we are carrying out now called, for example, the Sahara Forest Project, where we use seawater, sunlight and CO2 to produce fresh water, biomass and electricity, we need to understand that it's more than 4 billion people globally that the next 15 years need an increased income or at least a job. What should these people do? Should they dig for coal? Or should we find new ways of growing biomass like algae, halophytes, seaweed, and these kind of options? We think that there is a possibility, but that demands that the rich countries dare to go carbon negative, and that we dare to do this with trade, that we could buy, for example, sustainable produced biomass from developing countries without damaging their freshwater reservoirs and do that with coal firing with coal or even with biopower plants. I bought my first electrical cars ago, uh, uh, 20 years ago when it in average was two degrees colder in the Arctic. We had to drive illegally in the bus lane. We didn't pay taxes and the car was arrested 17 times and confiscated. And each time we went out to the car auction and bought the car back to drive illegally into Oslo in Norway again. We took with us different pop stars to create attention. Today, I can drive my Tesla car, and next year it comes as a family car. In the future, I hope that we will be able to power this on maybe electricity from a biopower plant with carbon capture. And each kilometer I drive, I remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And most of all, when we create the future combat strategies, we need to be sure that we are not making strategies that is dead end for carbon negative solutions. Because if James Hansen and McKibben is right, this is crucial to start now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to discuss what we should be doing about global warming. Uh, fundamentally, I think we need to perhaps have a little more realism in some of our wants and what we're actually going to achieve. I think, first of all, we need to realize to get balanced information. We were talking very much about how we need to move away from the denial of global warming. I think that's very true. But I think we likewise need to move away from the end of world kind of story, which I actually think uh, that which has been part of the story over the last uh, 10, 15 years, has turned off a lot of people from global warming. We also need to look at what are the current policies doing. And I think I'll agree with many of the people in the panel here that we're just not doing very well. But I think we need to learn from that and actually find smarter and better ways and not just hope that that would happen. So fundamentally, let me uh, go through a little bit and elaborate on some of these points. Uh, a lot of the apocalyptic information that gets out on global warming, I would argue, has been part of the reason why we've seen a dramatic downturn in people's concern about global warming over the last year or so. We've seen that in the US, but we've certainly also seen that in other countries. Uh, that has been aided with the problem from the, uh, some of the problems in the IPCC, the Himalaya glacier, and that kind of stuff. But the real point is, if you scare people witless, you can do that for a while and understand the wish of wanting to get people pushed. We need to do something. But if you scare people witless, you can't do that for 50 or 100 years. And so eventually, it's going to backfire. And that's essentially what we're seeing now. I would actually argue that panic is not a good way to inform our conversation. It's not a good way to find rational solutions. So I think we need to step back and realize, you know, if we look, for instance, at the economics of climate change, 
It tells us that global warming is a real problem. It's a big problem. It's in the order of magnitude of about $15 trillion if you look at the total impact of unmitigated global warming. But yet, let's also remember the net worth of the 21st century is on the order of $3,000 trillion. So we're talking about half a percentage point of the 21st century. Now, we can easily discuss, and I'm sure we'll get into that, is it a a one, one quarter of a percent? Is it even one percent? But the important point is to say it's nowhere near saying this is the end of the world. And that's important, because then we can start talking about global warming like we talk about other problems, namely finding sensible solutions. So let me just talk a little bit about how we think about the global problems right now. Well, the solution, the preferred solution, is let's promise to cut carbon emissions and do it dramatically and do it right here, typically in the developed world. It's not worked. It's not worked for 18 years. We promised in Rio in 1992 to cut our carbon emissions, yet we did no such thing. We promised again to cut even more in Kyoto, yet we did no such thing. Now, we had a total breakdown in Copenhagen last year, and yet most people seem to be saying, well, let's meet in Cancun by the end of this year and thresh out a, a, a new treaty or maybe make new promises in South Africa in 2011. I think at some point we got to stop believing that we're just going to keep on making these promises and actually not fulfilling them. We're not dealing with global warming, and there's a very substantial reason why that is happening. It's because the current policies are incredibly costly and will do fairly little good. Uh, the European 2020 decision to cut carbon emissions 20% by 2020 uh, is estimated to be costing about $250 billion a year. Yet the net effect, if the European, actually, Euro European Union actually delivers on this for the rest of the century, will be to cut carbon, sorry, to cut temperature by the end of the century by about 1 20th of a degree centigrade, or about 1 10th of a degree Fahrenheit. We won't even be able to measure that amount of money spent. That's silly. And if we look at the estimates for every dollar spent, we probably only avoid about half a cent of climate damage. That's a very poor way to help the future. So fundamentally, instead of asking, as Jocelyn talked about, we need a thought revolution or, or we need strong political leaders and, and we need to have a big carbon tax, we would all want the world to be like that. It would be great if we had visionary leaders that would not think about what the public would do, that would in, uh, tax uh, a, a large tax on carbon emissions, which would be probably political suicide, but it's not going to happen. So I think we do need to start talking about what can actually work. And the amazing thing is, we've actually asked, uh, I headed something called the Copenhagen Consensus for Climate, where we asked some of the world's top climate economists to look at all the different solutions and tell, ask them, where can we do the most good for climate for every dollar spent? What they told us was, don't try to cut carbon emissions just. If you even try to do it with a two degree centigrade, which everybody has signed up to, for every dollar spent, you'll only do a couple of cents of climate, uh, you'll only avoid a couple of cents of climate damage. That's a bad deal. But there is a great way to do it, namely invest dramatically more in research and development into clean energy. The fundamental point is right now, solar panels, just take an example, cost way more than fossil fuels, as was also alluded from other speakers. That's why only a few rich, well-meaning Westerners will put them up on their rooftops and feel very good about themselves. But if we actually want everyone to do this, we have to make solar panels so cheap everyone wants them. And we can only do that if we dramatically increase the research and development that goes into these solar panels. We're spending very, very little. And as we're promising more and more, we're actually spending less and less on research and development. That's the wrong way. What the economists actually show is that for every dollar spent here, you could probably avoid about $11 of climate damage, so about 500 times more good for every dollar spent than what we're doing right now. Why? Because it's about making sure that we get everybody on board for this technology in the long run. That is about making sure that we invest, and they proposed, spend about $100 billion a year. It's about half the cost of the Kyoto Protocol, which we didn't live up to, and it's 50 times more than what we do today. If we do that, and unfortunately I don't agree, we have the technologies yet, we would be able to get the technologies. The fundamental idea is to say we are never going to get politicians to make fossil fuels so expensive that nobody wants to use them. It's political suicide, and nobody wants that. But what we do need is to make sure that we make green energy so cheap that everybody will want it. Thank you.
Well, first of all, I, I just want to say many thanks, not only to Penn, but also to Bob Silvers and the New York Review, who have covered this issue more seriously and with uh, greater continuity than anybody else in the English-speaking world for uh, two decades now. And, uh, his willingness to be really serious about it, even when it's not been in fashion, has been really important. Um, we've heard lots of good ideas of different kinds. The thing that we haven't heard is how we're going to do them, how we're going to make any of them happen. Any solution to climate waits on a political movement large enough to force action to happen. I'm an odd person to say that because by background, I'm not a political activist. I'm a writer. My theory of political change when I was 28 and wrote The End of Nature 21 years ago, my theory of political change was people will read this book and then they will go out and solve the problem. That they did read the book. It came out in 24 languages, but that proved not to be a tremendously effective method. Uh, books, I think, are extremely important, and I keep writing them. But <laughs> politics is about power. Power yields to other power. The movement of, uh, uh, the, the, the drive to do something about the greatest problem that humans have ever faced by far has been incredibly weak. We have counted on the thought that simply having all the scientists and economists and engineers and policy people and nine and a half miles high worth of reports and documents would be enough to persuade people to take action. Uh, it has not happened. Uh, partly that's because we're up against the greatest force in the world economically that there's ever been. The reason that people are uh, confused about climate in this country is not because people have been preaching apocalypse to them. It's because last year the coal industry spent several hundred million dollars to make sure that they were confused about climate. So we've been trying to figure out how to make that kind of movement happen. And I'll just tell you quickly the story of this thing that we've done called 350.org, because hopefully it'll give you some optimism, and hopefully I can persuade some of you to help us. We took the number that Jim and his team provided, 350 parts per million CO2. If I'm quoting correctly from the abstract of the paper, uh, his team said, any value for carbon greater than that was not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. We took that and uh, uh, set out to organize uh, globally, always a hard thing to do. We had no money. There were seven young people and me. Seven was a good number because there were seven continents. Each one of them took one. The guy who got the Antarctic also took the internet because it's kind of its own continental landmass. And off we went. This was in the winter of 2008. And I think Jim was a little rightly skeptical that anything would come of this. But in fact, around the world, we found millions of people like ourselves around the world. We decided to take last October 24th as a day to kind of drive this number into the debate to make people understand what the stakes really were. And on that day, we managed to coordinate 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. Foreign Policy Magazine just said it was the largest ever coordinated global rally of any kind on any issue at any time. So the idea that... The idea that people do not care about this is simply incorrect. One of the things that's most interesting about those rallies, and if you want to, you can go to 350.org and look at the 25,000 pictures in our Flickr account from those events. One of the things that's most interesting about them is that they set the lie to the idea that environmentalism is something for rich white people when they uh, have all their other problems taken care of. Almost everyone in those pictures is poor, black, brown, Asian, or young, because that's what most of the world is made up of. And what do you know, they care just as much about the future as anybody else. We went to Copenhagen with a lot of momentum six weeks after that. And we were able to convince 117 nations to sign on to that 350 target. Again, they were the poorest nations, the places that are already feeling the effects of climate change most. 
So for political purposes, the wrong nations. We haven't yet convinced, built a movement large enough to convince the most addicted nations to begin taking that addiction seriously, to begin spending money on technology, to put that fee on carbon that Jim describes, to do all those things that are politically difficult to do. There's no shortcut to making that happen. The only way we will make that happen is if we continue to build a movement strong enough to force it to happen. We're gathering again around the world on October 10th this year, 10, 10, 10, no excuse for forgetting the date. And uh, we're having this time, instead of a political rally, a global work party. In thousands of places, people will be putting up solar panels, laying out bike paths, digging gardens, not because we are under any illusion that this will solve climate change. It will take that global agreement that Jim described to really change the price of carbon in ways that matter. But not only will it do a lot of good in particular neighborhoods around the world, hopefully this day will allow us to send a pointed political message which is, we're getting to work, what about you? If I can climb up on the roof of the school and hammer in a solar panel, perhaps you could be persuaded to rise to the floor of the Senate and hammer out a little legislation finally. The need for people to get to work is paramount. It's starting to happen, and it's starting to happen oddly in the poorest places in the world. I've been in cities in China where not because somebody ordered them to, where 98% of people have solar hot water panels on their roofs. They're not waiting for some other technology to come along. They're putting them up there because they make sense. We need to make sure that that happens. We're not going to prevent global warming. It is too late for that. This new book of mine has that odd title, E-A-A-R-T-H, because we've already built a new planet. Already the atmosphere holds 5% more moisture than it did. Already the ocean is 30% more acid. Already everything frozen on the planet is beginning to melt. It is a different place already, but it will get much different still and much faster all the time. So far we've raised the temperature of the Earth about a degree. The consensus is pretty clear that we're looking at four, five, six before the century is out unless we get things under control really, really fast. So my optimism, when I have it, lies in the fact that people are finally beginning to rise to this occasion and form that movement. There's no guarantee that we've started in time, and there's no guarantee that the uh, 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 vested interests to prevent action aren't so strong that we can't overcome them. Maybe if you were a betting person, you would bet that we will not win this fight, but that's not a bet, I think, that one is allowed to make. Clearly, our job is to figure out how to change those odds some. We can do it with your help, and I thank you very much for taking an interest here. Well, as the reporter, I'd like to go toward the end because I'm always reporting. I'm, I'm going to be tweeting on this later. And uh, especially on that notion of we need a universal uh, human obligation to go with the human rights. Um, I came through this issue, like Bill, I started in the uh, 1980s writing about climate change, mostly from the biophysical aspect of it. What is going on with these gases? Uh, what, is, what are the traits we have that are increasing the concentration? And then what, how do things respond? And then what do you do about it? It's all technical, wonky, physical, hard science and technology. The last five, seven years, I've slid ever more into, by, by far, you know, and I've, I've written about all of the most uh, ominous parts of the science, the slipping of the ice sheets, you know, standing on top of Greenland, going to the North Pole and standing on the sea ice and listening to the amazing cracking of that sound, the sound of that shifting ice under your feet, gets your attention. But the thing that really has gotten my attention the last five, six, seven years is, is this thing I wrote about on Dot Earth recently, which was, is the global warming problem in our head? And I don't mean a fiction. I mean, the problem is in our head. And if you want to get really upset and have disturbing dreams, listen to people like Paul Slovic, who's also written, a, he's a psychologist in, in Oregon who's written reams on genocide and why it keeps happening. And he's also looked at issues like global warming and why it, for 20 years you've seen stasis in these ridiculous meetings that I've had to go to for 20 years 
uh, with all these people in suits that the young people call fossils, which I love. Uh, I've written about the Fossil of the Day Award repeatedly in, in the Times. Um, but what Slovak has found and what many others have found is essentially there's certain char 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 categories of problems that don't fit the way human beings have evolved, both biologically and culturally. We're really bad at this kind of thing. I've had people as variegated as John McCain and a psychologist tell me the same thing. Uh, there's a psychologist named uh, Dan Siegel who says um, humans have a, a, a me map and a we map. And the me, if you can increase the we part of our consciousness, you can start to maybe pick at this problem a little more effectively. And I'm going to quickly list some of the reasons why it's what there's a, there's a, there are some economists who come up with really technical wonky names for problems like this. And one of them is, now hold on, it's hard, super wicked. This is an actual term. If you Google for the phrase super wicked and the word climate and, and the name Revkin, you'll find a, a tweet that I did recently on some really interesting disturbing papers on, on this. We're, we're just not going to get this in the old fashioned way we got the 20th century problems of an, an environment that uh, the pollution was in your face. You could see it. It was sending people to emergency rooms in your, in your, in your time. And, uh, we, and we had bipartisanship on all the major legislation that has turned the Hudson River from an open sewer to this swimmable place where Bill was, I think, kayaking today. I bet you got wet while you were doing that. But you're not worrying about, you know, do I need to take a pill? Um, those problems were solvable in, in, in a time scale where a politician or a community could say, ah, we did that. This one isn't going to work that way. It won't work that way. The IPCC report that Cynthia and has worked so long on that Jim's, Jim's re research has gone into, one of the less understood realities laid out in the IPCC report is that even if we had a very aggressive policy on greenhouse gases now, even essentially if emissions were stable now, bang, we're not increasing. China's not adding a coal powered plant every week. If we did that now, you, there would be no discernible, measurable deviation in the planet's uh, uh, climate trajectory. You couldn't kind of in 2050 come back and say, ah, oh, see, there's the deflection point. We did that. So we have to get over the fact that this is something that we can kind of expect to play out on our watch. And this gets back to the, the novelist's reality that there are fundamental uh, issues of values we have to start examining. One thing I've been saying lately is one of the things of the 20th century uh, memes of the environmental movement that's still valuable in specific instances, which is, woe is me, shame on you. Those two things are like, if you look at uh, the books that I wrote, uh, the books that Bill wrote, somewhere in all the, a lot of my coverage for the Times, even on things like climate, I've, I've pointed the finger when people have done that. But for, going forward from here, while that still serves a purpose sometimes when there's uh, true corruption and true dishonesty, which exists, uh, that's not going to solve the problem. By pointing the finger at Exxon or Peabody Coal, which I just wrote about on Earth Day, their quarterly report, boom, coal, global coal is just having a party right now. Uh, and they were having it on Earth Day. Um, you're not going to change those trajectories by blaming somebody for something. We're buying the electric, we need the electricity, we need the mobility, we crave these things. And if we don't turn the mirror on ourselves and start to examine the values evolution that has to take place, so that we start to value the future, as, as you heard, so that we start to integrate into our, and make it a norm henceforth that when we make an energy decision, it's, it's, a, it's a decision involving equity and other issues as well, environmental quality for a long time. Um, that's why when I shifted Dot Earth, when I moved, I had this kind of momentous shift as a writer in December. I, the day after I left the Copenhagen talks, I became a former New York Times reporter. And um, the last month, or about a month ago, I, I started doing the blog, the Dot Earth blog for the Times as a freelancer. And as of a month ago now, I'm an opinion writer. I'm, I'm there with Tim Egan and Paul Krugman and all those people uh, doing but I'm an online column, essentially. The first day, the first column of my inaugural um, Unleashed, <laughs> Revkin Unleashed uh, life, I, I, I stated the following. I said, if you, um, <clears throat> if, you have, uh, if you have to have a car, so you got a Prius, OK, and you have a choice of only one bumper sticker, and there's two options. And one says, fight the climate crisis. And one says, join the energy quest. Which would you feel a little bit more you know, excited about? We have to start thinking about these issues more in a sense of excitement and not and less in an a sense of woe is me, shame on you, it's someone else's fault. And I can, maybe as we go forward, I can articulate a little bit more about what that means. So thank you. The motto of the mayor's summit 
was and is cities act. Now there's an unspoken part of that motto, which is while nations talk. Because it turns out that cities are the natural first responders to climate change. Why is that? First, they are, let's go to the mitigation side first, the reduction of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So depending on how you do the calculations, city activities, activities in the, the economies of cities, are responsible for somewhere between 40 to 80 percent. It depends on whom you, Lord, St Lord Nicholas Stern uh, goes up all the way to 80. But of course, you know, it's like who's paying for the jet fuel, fuel uh, tra for, for all of us who are traveling ac around cities, for example. But they, certainly because as drivers of um, the economies, uh, cities have a strong role to play in greenhouse gas emissions and therefore a strong role to play in their mitigation. On the other hand, cities which are more and more uh, located and population more and more located on the coasts and on coastline are tremendously vulnerable to climate change as well, particularly sea level rise and coastal flooding. So, uh, but at the same time also to higher temperatures because of the urban heat island in which, because cities are higher, are hotter than uh, the surrounding uh, rural areas in any case. And, and here in cities also we have uh, higher air pollution. So there are also strong reasons why cities are on the front lines of climate change vulnerability as well. I think also politically, the leadership, the political leaders of, of cities, the mayors, are also closer to their constituents than all those 128 heads of state who flew into Copenhagen. You know, and they had all their security teams around them. The mayors are actually out with their citizens and they understand that they, they seem to get that responding to climate change is just a really, really important and smart thing to do. So they, uh, the leaders of the, um, uh, there's a group called the C40, which is the 40 largest cities of the world. And um, there's another group called ICLE, which is local governments that is taking a leading role both in mitigation and adaptation. And uh, together, the cities, I think, need to be uh, paid attention to as, as the leaders. Now let's turn to right here in New York, leaders in leaders, leadership in responding. Now let's turn to here in New York, what's happening right here in, our, in this city, in our own city. First of all, we do have a leader who gets it. Mayor Bloomberg has, uh, was at both the conference in Bali, the previous uh, conference, climate change conference, he was in Copenhagen, and he has established a sustainability plan for New York City that includes both a mitigation goal, a target and timetable that the nation states and the, the presidents and heads of state have such a hard time doing. We have that here uh, in New York, which is a beginning, not the most aggressive, but a, but a beginning of 30% reduction by 2030 and is following up that goal with actual programs and on the ground, that on the ground actions that Bill and Andy and others were talking about. So that there is a green building code that is coming out for construction here. There is energy, uh, energy audit so that our very old and, and aging infrastructure here, which is our major source of greenhouse gases here, are, are, have, we have guidelines to actually start now. Let's now finally talk about uh, adaptation in New York as well because New York is very vulnerable to climate change because of sea level rise and the enhanced flooding that then um, comes from having higher sea levels. And uh, they, in not just the five boroughs, but in the whole metropolitan region, 40 
agencies and organizations, including the corporations, by the way, the telecoms, who all who, who, who uh, provide us all our cell phones, the, our energy providers, our transportation, MTA, et cetera, have come together in the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. And they are developing flexible adaptation pathways to deal with the challenges because while we focus, we have to focus on mitigation to reduce those, those ultimate levels that are so important at the planetary scale, we also are going to have, we have already, and are going to have climate changes that we are going to need to adapt to. And cities are stepping, our own city, New York, and cities around the world are stepping up to this challenge. Thank you. Well, now, uh, I must say that we've had a, quite a variety of, of views, but they are linked. They are linked by uh, a undertone and, and sometimes an overtone of the very strong political difficulty that this issue is encountering. And um, there is the question that keeps arising, whether in the Western nations um, the political will to take large measures uh, can be mobilized. And, <clears throat> and among the various views we heard, um, I had trouble finding a, a strong current of optimism about that question. I thought it was great to hear about Mayor Bloomberg's concerns about this question, uh, but I wonder if, let us say, his efforts were replicated in a number of American cities. Would that adequately address the kinds of predictions that Jim and Bill were projecting? which is something like at the end of the century, as much as, Bill, didn't you say, four or five or six percent. So I'd like to, I wonder if we can uh, have some comment that might address more directly the question of what kind of political changes may be required. Well, I think that, in fact, what is needed is not all that difficult if we had political leaders who, or one, one leader who would stand up and say what is needed. And if they would be honest about, as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, we'll keep using them. The only way that the public will allow a significant rising price on fossil fuels is if, is if it's very simple, if it's very clean. It can't be the big banks with some trading scheme. That, there's, no, there's no way that they will go for that. But if it's a simple, honest thing where they can track the money and see that is, is in fact going back to the public, I think they would support that. And that's the way that you get the investment that Bourne talked about. You, you, want, you don't want the government deciding how to invest the money. As soon as the business community sees that the price of carbon is going to be going up, and as soon as the public knows that that's true, in the case of a cap, by the way, the price goes all over the place and the public doesn't know what's going to happen. That's why you want a, a gradually rising carbon price. And, the uh, John uh, Larson in the House defined a rising price, which after 10 years would be up to a dollar a gallon of gasoline. That would re result in a 30 percent reduction in United States emissions in 10 years, much more than the cap schemes would. If something simple like that, and if the public understands we need this because to get our energy independence, to solve our addiction to fossil fuels, I, I think the public would support that. So 
Public would support it, uh, given that there were political leaders willing to take the step. And they have to tell the honest, you know, they should have, like Franklin Roosevelt, have a fireside chat, explain this, because they do have to understand the difference between cap and trade and a, a fee and dividend, fee and green check. Can I add one? I focused on this a lot. Could I just briefly? Okay. Just, just briefly, I, I would take issue. I mean, I think we agree on the, on the point that we do need to move to a way we, where we have technology that will make it much cheaper. I would argue two things, though. Uh, if we look at the, uh, at the surveys, uh, people say that they really care about global warming. Then you ask them, how much are you willing to pay? And it turns out that only 10% of Americans are willing to pay more than $100 a year. Y you know, you've got to be kidding. That's not going to get us anywhere. And so, yes, I do recognize that you can talk to people and you can get them to understand this better, but I think we need to recognize you can have a small carbon tax and that can fund a research and development, but you cannot have in any reasonable future, and certainly not in vast parts of the world, a large carbon tax. Let me also just briefly make a point on, uh, you, you said that we should not have governments investing in this. I, I would actually argue that we, we exactly should have governments investing because it's very hard to have either private corporations investing because as you also very well know, uh, we can say that we're going to have huge carbon taxes in 50 years. That's incredibly cheap for current politicians to be promising future, future, future generations of politicians to be enacting. But honestly, you know, it's very hard to believe that that's actually going to happen. Right. But Larson's bill's 10 years, and the economic models show that will result in a 30 percent reduction. That's not but, 50 but, years. But, yeah, no, but clearly, do we really believe that we're going to be buying a, 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 a carbon tax? I don't know what that re Just reflects to, but that's probably like $80 or $90 I, per ton. I have to put that in the global context, though, as well. The other issue here is, um, the, there's no evidence that that kind of a, sli a, a ramping up, if, especially if money isn't going to R&D, if it's going back to consumers, that that would lead to the innovation that would be required to decarbonize the energy system for a world heading toward 9 billion people who want to live like us. So that's, the, I agree with Bjorn on this, and there's been studies, and you know, energy forecasts are just as bad as just any other kind of forecast you can think of. The IEA projected recently at Copenhagen, they rolled out this study they said it would only be in 2025 that they anticipate the carbon price would be high enough to actually start making companies do investments differently. So 2025, that's 15 more years from where we are now before you would actually see the technology changing. No, that, now, it, Jim, the that's economic that's model shows that you get a 30 percent reduction it, with that. Up. Jim, can you bring it up? Yeah. The, uh, already, that rate is sufficient to have a major impact in, on, on uh, emissions. In America? Yeah but it's not creating the next generation technology that you would well, need yeah, to make I, it cheap enough for China to do it. Uh, China, China is making all the investments. It's number one now in solar, wind, and nuclear, new nuclear plants, and, or, or will be within a year. And because they know they've got to go that way. But they're, they also are number one in coal growth, and this is all on that's top right, of coal. That's right, that's right. And that's why they, and they understand that they've got to that's the, why they're making these investments in the clean energies is because they know they've got to get off coal. They've, their air is so polluted and their water is so polluted. So that's where they're headed. They, they want to put scrubbers in to make their air less polluted. They're investing in solar and wind because they're going to sell it to us. Sure. And you know, that's, that's, that's great for them. Should, but that's you know, what let's, we should have done. But, but let's just be honest about it. Then it doesn't mean jobs for us. It means jobs that we're supporting jobs in China. Maybe that's good. Unless but it has start, very little to do with start climate, doing it here. Yeah. climate change. We're, we're losing a chance. Were you wanting to say something? No. No. Only that there's actually, you know, we, we actually have sort of real world experience of this. Everybody in this room remembers what happened in this country in the summer of 2008 when the price of gasoline went briefly to $4 a gallon, and all of a sudden, millions upon millions of Americans discovered that, you know, a military vehicle was not required to get to the grocery store. <laughs> um, you've got to, um, uh, you've got to, you've got to figure out how to do that without bankrupting people, because otherwise there won't, as Bjorn points out, be the political support for it. That's why Jim has supplied the answer to Bjorn's query by pointing out that if you give everybody that money back, if you collect it from Exxon, 
Exxon runs the price up at the pump. Everybody gets the price signal, but they also get enough money back to keep themselves from going bankrupt. Then there's some hope that you can begin to, to uh, 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 break this cycle. And do, you feel, do you feel that the sources of investment that are needed uh, for improved technology can be achieved through that? I'm a real, I mean, I, it's the, one of the oddest things about you, all of this believe, at the moment that is that in- Not such a deep need for that well, kind of one of the things that's going, I actually think that there's, you know, we've, we, government should be spending money on this too, because government has a role in basic R&D, and I'd take it straight out of the Defense Department budget, which I don't think we need much of anymore. But, um, but the, um, but it's, I mean, the, the point is that if we don't, if you think that this really is a serious, I mean, a, unbelievably serious problem, then something has to be done quickly to break the psychology of the... Environmentalists, oddly, are, are, are bigger believers in markets at this point than just about anybody else because there's clearly no other lever big enough to pull in the time that we have other than that price signal that we can send. Um, if you, if you want to argue otherwise, then you have to argue, as Bjorn does, that it's really not that big a problem and we've got a lot of time to deal with it. No, or you've got to be now arguing a, that it's not going to happen. We have one man who has mentioned violence in this discussion. I, I think, first of all, when we discuss this, we must remember that as long as the political leaders in Copenhagen doesn't achieve an agreement, people does uh, end up thinking that, well, then it's maybe then not so serious because then the leaders have taken responsibility. Then I think also we must remember how strong forces we are f f fighting against when it comes to the fossil fuel industry. The fossil fuel industry is subsidized with more than a billion dollar globally every day. And look at the American economy, uh, how much it costs to import all this oil. This is not simply easy logic questions. It's also a power game. And I think, therefore, it's so dangerous with, with, with for example, the argumentation from Mr. Lomborg here, uh, where he says we, we should be careful in, in uh, scaring people. But this is not any longer just a, a red alarm lamp. This is a whole blinking discotheque with information <laughs> that this is a crucial thing to do. And, and for me, it's very easy. We need more than taxes. We also need mandatory and regulatory framework to, to be able to go green by black numbers. I know a friend here would like to say something. Well, you know, I, I still believe in reason, in communication, in persuasion. I believe, as Hansen mentioned, that uh, there is a possibility that uh, uh, honest politicians are standing, uh, you know, uh, 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 like, like, I mean, uh, what happened uh, when, 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 when Churchill was elected uh, prime minister? What did he say? Gold, pearls, uh, no, he said, I have nothing to offer but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. And by that, he mobilized the people. Why? Because people saw the emerging danger of, 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 of the, the German army, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming towards the British Channel, the English Channel. So, so I, I believe that, uh, like, like McKibben, your effort, like Hadson's efforts, like, of course, Al Gore's book and movie, even the current president of the United States, when he was campaigning, he was uh, speaking clearly about this. The problem is that he's in his first period, but I believe that it's pos even in America, it's possible <laughs> to, 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 to persuade people that, uh, uh, well, well, we have, from n nature, we have a, 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 a need to defend our dreams. We are defending our own dreams, but we are, have not the natural capacity to defend our dreams in three or four or five generations. That's something we have to learn, just like we had to learn the whole list of human rights, you know? Uh, it's, not, we are not, it's not an inborn ability to defend your dreams in four generations from now. Only to defend your own dreams and your children's dreams. We have a lot of lessons to learn. 
and I believe that people are listening to, to wise people, even politi politicians. I think the issue has diffused far, far more than perhaps this uh, throughout society, far more than this discussion might, uh, might lead, lead us to believe. Uh, last year, in the course of 24 hours, I gave three different talks to three different groups in New York City, in Manhattan, actually, not too far from here. The first one was the, to the American Bar Association, all the New York lawyers, a thousand people, and a thousand lawyers, New York lawyers. They were in there finding out what they can do. They're on it. They're figuring out what their society can do, as, and they as lawyers. Then I went and gave a talk at the Arsenal, the head of the Parks Department, right, right up, either up or down, right here in Central Park. Over 200 people came to hear about the planting of a million trees in New York City, which, which stores carbon, uh, shades buildings so it reduces uh, air conditioning need, and helps the people adapt because it keeps the people of New York cooler. So those people got it. Then the next morning, we went up, I went up to Fordham. There were 500, it was a conference of environmental justice activists, and they were completely energized for this. So I think that when I go, not only in New York, but around the world, there is tremendous movement on this issue, and that we, of course, we have to continue and capture, but, but much has, is already going on. I'd like to just interject one thing that gets, it's, it's product, hopefully productive. One thing that's important to understand in an issue like this is to understand where you're starting from. And on the uh, energy innovation arena, which I've written about for many years now, starting with a piece in 2006 on declining research and development investment in a world getting more concerned about energy, um, we have been utterly asleep. There's a graph I could show you. you just go to my blog, go to the, the one I did on Energy Quest that shows 50 years in America of what we spend our research money on. There's a huge $75 billion a year for defense R&D. That's just, you know, coming up with the next cool weapon, not defense, you know, tanks and planes. There's $40 billion a year for health. Hey, you know, we care about health. We'd like to live longer lives. And a lot of that actually people think wasn't spent very well. And in our, we've had this bipartisan disinterest in energy innovation for decades when we had the little bubble of interest during the oil crisis in the 1970s, when it got up to five billion a year, basic R&D spending in this country on energy. Five, that was the max, that was a peak. And now because of the stimulus money, there's this little bubble of about two or three billion right now. And uh, John Holdren, the science advisor to the president, in a paper that I cited in 2006, before he was in, in White House, he said it would take a two and a half cent rise in the gas tax to triple our basic R&D budget in this country. So. We are, uh, don't let anybody out there put a, who's putting out a press release saying we doubled our solar research budget in Washington bamboozle you into thinking we're remotely engaged on energy innovation. Which means it's easy to do. No, I think, of course, we need more research money on, on renewable energies and clean energy technologies. But I also think it's extremely important to understand that the only way to get the price down is large-scale deployment of these technologies that we already have. And again, I think Lomborg is, is misrepresenting the, the, the real facts here. Because if you look at what has happened in Germany, we could all agree that Germany is not the most efficient place to put solar panels. But it's extremely important that they have done it. Because if the rich countries are not going ahead in making use of these technologies, we don't get the price down. And I think when we look at the economic situation in the West, uh, we are creating now a geopolitical very bad situation with all the import of oil. I think if you take today's oil price, uh, the only thing US is doing is spending around 400 billion dollars yearly on their state budget importing oil. And, and Lundberg and others need to understand that this is old forces that is already existing, have the power today, and we have to break it down by making use of the other technologies. It's not always necessary with more research. It's the large-scale deployment in these technologies that will bring the price down, and it's time for that now. It's, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, 
covered to say that we only need the research. We need well, no one is saying it. only. I think there's a false dichotomy here. No, but I think what Bloomberg said in his speech was well, more let research. Me just, let me just uh, respond to that because it's, to a, make use it's, of a, it. it's a great point in saying, no, no, we should deploy a lot right now. But if it's incredibly inefficient, as you just mentioned with the German solar panels, solar panels are incredibly inefficient. They are very, very costly. So Germany has put up they what is estimated costly, about $75 billion of solar panels, and, uh, and, and these are direct subsidies to these solar panels, so this is above what they're getting back for the energy. That effect will be to postpone global warming by the end of the century by about three hours. It's nothing. So they basically spent a lot of money, very inefficiently put up lots of nice solar panels that gives great photo ops for politicians, but really, what was it we wanted? Was it to have $75 billion worth of solar panels, or was it to get much cheaper solar panels so that everyone, including the Chinese and the Indians, would buy it? The point is, if you imagine spending $75 billion on inefficient technology, sure, a little bit of that is going to go into research and development, but if the goal was to get cheaper solar panels in the future, we should have spent all of that $75 billion on research and development, made solar panels cheaper Th this is ridiculous, uh, like two or three years this before they really would have been. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. So you would rather spend $75 billion to do no good rather than spend $75 billion and but do a lot of good? But look at the cost of solar panels. They are really going down because that some brave politicians in Germany dare to do this program. But and if, if we don't do that, we will not get the cost down. And it's very promising what we see in the future solar panel price. As a middle child, can I offer one more little? Yeah. And I am. Is anyone else here a middle child, actually? I'm curious. Uh, oh, look. The middle children are in the middle. Lower middle. Lower middle. I'm going to do a very little brief bit of arithmetic just to get you a sense of the scope of what would happen to have those solar panels spring up in the places where they're needed. Uh, we're in a world that now has close to 7 billion people. Next year, maybe the year after, it will be 7. We're heading toward 9. It's very hard to see a diversion from roughly 9 billion people. Um, right now, the richest of us here in America, we emit 20 tons of, green, of CO2 per person per year. So we're 20. Uh, China, well, India, most people in India, and remember, India is the new China. India is going to be 2 billion people in 2050, while China is shrinking. They, 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 they emit, the average person in India emits about one ton per person per year. So 20 tons up here, one ton down here. Europe is about 10, roughly. So it's, Europe is really cool, man. You know, it's a very efficient place. Everybody drives little cars. And so they're like that nice, comfy middle. Europe wants to go, I think, to about six tons per person per year by 2030 or so, something like that. So they, that, that's a really great goal. China is expecting to go up to six tons per person as they advance. So let's say the whole world did this amazing heavy lift. We're all going to go to six. So Americans come down from 20 to six. India goes up to six. So now it's nine billion times six tons is 54 billion tons of CO2 per year. That's uh, what one and a half times today's emissions by 2050. So, so we've still doubled the emissions. So anyone who says that we can get 80% reduction in emissions by 2050 using things we can just deploy now is, is um, not in the world of people I talk to who actually do these calculations. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, one perspective we haven't mentioned. I mean, since I'm representing the, the, the oh, sorry, I'm representing the moral philosophy here. I mean, even if we for, forget about the climate uh, uh, question, you know, we should only permit ourselves to use non-renewable resources to the extent that we at the same time pave the way for our descendants to be able to manage without the same resources. Uh, uh, if, if we for, forget to think about our descendants, they will never forget about us. <laughs> well, thank you. It's Jim's turn because you wanted to respond precisely to Andy. Yeah, well, what I wanted to say was that, yeah, Germany, the reason they put this money in solar was they're hoping that the price will come down. But we really need to let the marketplace make the decisions. We, we need to do some basic R&D uh, long term, and government should do that. But the private sector, the R&D that they can put in dwarfs what the, the government can do. And that's why the fundamental requirement is a rising price on carbon. And once, once uh, private industry sees that's real, 
then they will, you, we will be surprised at the innovations that they come up with. Um, you know, ExxonMobil and the other oil companies were ready to begin to invest in nuclear power and in renewable energies, and then they realized we weren't serious, uh, that this fossil fuels are so cheap, that's where they can make the money. And they've got so much money, they have to understand there's a rising carbon price. And then these projections that Andy's making are never going to happen. We can, in fact, phase out of the carbon based fuels and move to a clean energy future, but it requires a price on carbon. While we're debating the uncertainties, both in the ability of, of our societies to find the technologies and political mechanisms to uh, lower the ultimate magnitude and rate of climate change. It's very important that we keep in mind that we have to be adapting to a changing climate at the same time. Because given the track rec record so far that we're globally not getting our act together, and I'm saying our act together, not anybody else's, it is all our act, the climate is already changing. It is projected to change. As I came in tonight, there were skateboarders, kids skateboarding. And one, besides the tipping point image that Jim uses a lot, we can think of ourselves on one of those skateboard ramps, that we're on a skateboard, and that ramp is going, shooting up. And the climate, we're going to have to be dealing with a changing climate as we do the research for the mitigation, as we deploy it as well. And the entire synergistic and sometimes antagonistic part, uh, potential for mitigation and adaptation needs to be taken into account as well. In 2007, in the Times, we did a series called The Climate Divide, which gets at one of the moral issues here. We, we've spent 150 years burning fossil fuels, getting wealthy and very technologically enabled. And we're already shielding ourselves from climate risk using wealth and technology. Perth, Australia, a number of years ago, built a, a wind-powered desalination plant. Dry city, drying continent, subcontinent. And they're already turning drinking seawater into drinking water by using the wind. So that's, that's the vivid illustration of what you can do if you've, in the face of inevitable climate change. Now, the flip side is, of course, in, in Botswana or in Mali, they don't have any of that, and we're not prepared to give them any help for that. that one of the big reasons that when we were all sitting in Copenhagen watching things go, go off the rails is because the divide is that the people have had no history of burning, of getting rich yet or have, having any technology or any money. They're in, in the, maybe mainly in semi-tropical areas, sitting ducks for today's climate risk, let alone what happens through the greenhouse gases, and they're saying they're getting pissed off. And, you know, in Maldives and all these other places we've, some of us have been, uh, that divide is only going to be bridged if another aspect of that energy quest that I talk about is providing energy options that are suited to places like that that are trying to come out of poverty. You know what, though? What was interesting to be in Copenhagen was those countries were the ones who were saying there's not enough aid in the world to help us if we're underwater, if our pastures have turned to desert. We're not, I mean, we'll take it, we deserve it, whatever, but those were the countries whose main message at Copenhagen was, US, Europe, get your act together and cut your emissions now. And one of the reasons that that's true, I think, and, and it sort of goes to the point, I think, of why uh, most of the people I work with are 25 and under, which actually is what most, of, I think, most people in the world are now, but certainly most people I, that, that are taking leadership roles on this. And it's precisely because, A, they're a little less sort of despairing, and it's just sort of like we're going to get down to it and do what we can, and, and B, because they're going to have to live with this for a very long time. So they want that change now. It's quite all right for, you know, uh, uh, you know to sit back in uh, this, oh, it's very hard, whatever, we, you know, here it all said. They're actually making change start to happen. And 
all the changes that people are talking about up here. I mean, I've been sitting listening quietly and interestedly to all of this discussion, but none of these changes happen until there's a political movement that makes them happen. None of them happen magically. And that is the one thing that's within our power easily to create, especially if we stop trying to minimize or deny what's going on and say straightforwardly. And one of the really interesting illustrations for that, of that for us was that when we decided to use Jim's number 350 as the centerpiece for this organizing campaign, there were lots of people all over the world who said, this is too complicated, people won't get it. Don't do that, use some slogan, say something about Energy Quest or whatever, whatever you want. People completely got it all over the world. Nobody had trouble understanding. I mean, when you walk outside tonight, think to yourself, the air I'm breathing is 390 parts per million CO2, 40 parts more than the most eminent climatologist in the world has just told us is safe in any way. And I mean, it's as if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, your cholesterol's too high. You don't then sit and think, oh, well, it's much too hard for me to figure out how to change and I'm used to doing things a certain way. And but you say, you know, where's the pill and, and what do I eat now? And, you know, all of that, let's get to work. Well, you know, at some level, hard as it is, that's what's got to happen. And it has to, and, and the other thing that's good about 25-year-olds I've found is that they're mature in a way that some of the rest of us aren't always. They say, look, we know that things are already bad, that we've caused lots of problems, that the world that we've been left is not as good as the one that uh, our parents were born onto. We're not going to moan about it. We're going to do all that we can now. And it is incredibly inspiring to see them doing it. Now, let me Final moment at Bjorn, I know, has been very patient and waiting. And then I'm then going to ask him to say something, and then Jim. All right, just two quick things. Uh, we were both in Copenhagen, and, and maybe you've heard other people speak. But the amazing thing was, yes, a lot of developing countries were asking us to cut carbon emissions. But I actually spoke to quite a few of the representatives there. And then I asked them, all right, so if you had your choice, what would you rather have, us cut carbon emissions or get more money? And they were all saying money. So yes, it may be beautiful to believe that they wanted the other thing, but at the end of the day, this is much more, and we got to be honest about that, to say, well, it's very, very clearly, they are talking about saying they would like to have $100 billion from the developing world, because that's what's going to get Botswana drinking water right now. And we've got to be honest about that. And sitting here and believing that it's otherwise is just simply fooling ourselves. The second part I'd just like to briefly mention was uh, 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 Jim said, and quite rightly, if we get a huge carbon tax going, we will solve the problem. That's true. That's one way. The economist would indicate that that's a pretty expensive way of doing it, even if we return the money, because we're essentially making one of the building blocks of our economy, uh, sorry, of our, yes, of our economy harder to achieve. But fundamentally, it's just not going to happen. We're essentially saying, if we can make the solution, then we can make the solution. I would suggest that, given our track record over the last 18 years of not being able to do so, maybe we should aim for a little lower, which would actually also solve the problem, namely a $7 carbon tax or something on, on that order, a low carbon tax, six cents per the ga on gallon. That's doable. And then use that money on research and development, 50-fold increase the research and development in the world, and actually make those technologies available so that in 20 to 40 years, we will all be driving electric cars, we will all be having solar panels, not because we were told to do so, but because it actually ended up being cheaper than using fossil fuels. Thank you, Fiona. Now, Jim. And, that's, and Jim will, will be our, our final speaker. I just want to make the comment that I think the Chinese government gets it, and they are moving in the right direction, and they, within several years, would be willing to get together with the West if we do our part. But, you know, they, uh, they want to have, they want to clean up their country, and they want, they do not want to get the fossil fuel addiction that the United States has and all the problems that has with it, protecting a supply line around the world, et cetera. So, but the problem is more in the U.S. How we've got these two parties who are just at each other. They will not cooperate. They just, after one election, they're already 
planning how they can get power back in the next election. I think, I think frankly, we need a third party. And even if it's a, even, even if it's a, it, it's said that the U.S. Constitution and thing are set up to sort of prevent, uh, to force the bi a two-party system, but it doesn't need to be very large. A, a party in the middle would really be in the position that they could be bipartisan with one of the others and get things done. But right now, we're just at loggerheads and we don't get anything done. Now, I want to say, I want to say we've heard much hope and we've heard much realism, and I want to thank all our speakers very much.